Good morning, everyone. Well, welcome back again. Um, we uh, this is our last planned talk. Um, there's there's been a little shakeup with the homegrown series. Um, it's being uh, kind of re redesigned. Uh, Paul Winsky, the um, county extension. Um, Green industry agent uh, has now become a program specialist, so he's still with AgriLife. We may see him back here at some point. Uh, but moving forward, uh, just keep a, um, an eye on your homegrown newsletters, which one will go out in March. Um, just letting you know what kind of changes uh, will be happening. Uh, in the meantime, today I have uh, Shannon Sullivan, who is uh, our Harris County ex, um, assistant agent helping, and then um, the Galveston horticulture agent Stephen Bergerhoff uh, has been gracious enough to help today. So, uh, whatever questions that you have come in um, that you sent that you type in, uh, he uh, he'll be able to uh, help you out there. So. Today's uh, topic is the top T questions. I, I title it this because really typically those are the top three questions we get, turf, trees, and tomatoes. Um, it, you know, it could be, uh, you know, uh, a, a rabbit hole that we're gonna go down, um, <laughs> but really, you know, the in intent of today is to uh, address some of these most, the more common questions um, and just help you out a bit there. Uh, and then any additional questions, uh, you know, you can go ahead and put in the chat. And if we can't get to them, then perhaps we will, um, you know, we'll do a follow up. So we're just diving right in. <laughs> turf all right so you know what there's there's a few questions that are just consistent throughout the year and this one has some variations on how it's asked how do i revive the grass under my large tree or what's the best grass um, to grow in shade uh, and usually this happens when grass fails under mature um, don't know why that's coming up that way. Okay, it's, it's, it's coming up funny on my end, but not on yours. Um, so uh, browning of grass can happen, you know, there's, there's numerous reasons, um, but when it is uh, underneath a mature tree, um, I've just gone ahead and made this up. I call it turf grass denial. Um, <laughs> The um, insistence that turf grass must grow under mature trees. Um, or the other thing that kind of plays with our minds here is that, um, well, the tree down the street, you know, the yard down the street looks exactly like mine, but why are they able to grow grass? And, and you know, I can't. Well, every situation is different. Stresses are different. Um, we really can't compare, you know, neighbor to neighbor. Um, but the um, biggest symptoms are thinning, um, thinning of the grass. Now, if you see thinning of the grass, especially um, more so closer um, to the trunk of that tree, then it's, you know, it's because of that tree. Uh, other symptoms are that perhaps you do, you already know that you have varying levels of shade. Uh, you have poor growth in that grass and that you have a weeds establishing. So it's not necessarily a weed issue. It's um, that the grass is, is thinning. Um, the other thing when we talk about sunlight um, with the varying levels of shade is that, uh, especially with live oaks, a lot of our questions concern live oaks, that um, there's a lot of roots. So there's competition for um, you know, for those water resources. So how do we deal with poor turf grass under trees? Uh, you know, some will enlist an arborist um, to come in and help trim the trees, prune out some of the bigger branches, get sunlight through. Uh, I mean, when it's with the help, when it, when it helps the tree, the health of that tree, okay, I can get that. Um, but if it's merely to create more sunlight down below, then perhaps we just need to shift our perspective because, you know, the more that you trim up trees, the, the um, 
when they're not when it's not necessary, uh, the more uh, you're inviting, um, you know, pests and disease. So watch that trimming trees. Uh, pick a shade tolerant turf. Around here, St. Augustine is more tolerant than Bermuda, and there's many yards with St. Augustine, um, but it still needs uh, generally at least four hours of direct sunlight. Um, so, you know, it can only, it can only do so much, um, but what I'm going to throw out there is perhaps that perspective shift is not to insist that we grow grass in a in a in a place where it is really in, inhospitable for grass to grow. Um, you know, this picture right here is kind of really indicative of a mature live oak um, that's really large. Um, but uh, you know, it's it is it does tend to be more soil. So maybe um, think about a shade tolerant ground cover, and that is going to put us into the next slide. Um, we do get a lot of questions, um, especially with the master gardeners. They get a ton of questions about lawn alternatives. Um, you might know, you might have heard grass is a monoculture. I mean, you look out, you know, if you do have weeds, you want to get rid of them. You don't want them flowering. Um, so it's, it's really a, um, it's a habitat that doesn't support a lot of wildlife. Um, in the soil, down in the soil, um, yes, you know, it's teeming with life, but above, not much. Um, so if you've tried to lay sod one too many times, uh, you know, you do have that bare soil, consider um, some kind of lawn alter alternative. It could be extending that bed um, and adding some shade um, shrubs in there, maybe not too close to the trunk, um, a ground cover, or even just mulching it. You know, you're getting getting rid of that um, need for um, the fight with the lawn. So here are um, some some recommendations. Uh, number one, shade tolerant, definitely not aggressive. You want to stick with something that you know you're not going to have to fight. Um, it can involve uh, vines and perennials. So uh, liriope up at the top, uh, it grows a little bit um, taller than mondo grass, about 18 inches tall with those uh, purple spikes. Um, it's real flowy, it moves with the wind. Um, liriope tended to get hit by this last freeze a little bit more than the mondo grass. That doesn't mean it, it didn't come back. Um, you know, it grows back beautifully. Uh, Asiatic jasmine, uh, it, it, okay, I'll put it out there around the Houston area. It could be used a little too much, but man, it is hard to deny when it's in bloom. I just roll down my windows and enjoy it. Um, it can take sun or shade. I mean, if you need to, you can mow it back. If it get hit, gets hit by a freeze, it comes back, um, but it's pretty low maintenance once it gets established. Uh, mondo grass, this picture um, is showing a dwarf mondo grass, you know, might get about six to eight inches tall. Regular, a little bit taller, six to ten. Um, I personally love mondo grass. I love how it looks. It, it looks, it really softens edging. Um, but um, even though this is your, this picture is not showing a full like ground cover, it can definitely either the dwarf or the regular can be used as um, a really lovely um, ground cover that typically stays evergreen. And then a juga is one of my personal favorites. There are just so many different um, um, varieties of this. Um, it can come with a bigger leaf, smaller leaf, more burgundy. Um, there's burgundy glow, there's silver beauty. Um, but with those um, flower spikes, it could, I mean, depending on the, depending, you know, it's really going to span a lot. Typically, a juga is going to grow really um, close to the ground, less than six inches, um, except for those big leaf varieties. The flowers are going to pop it up another two, three, maybe four inches. All right, um, next question. My St. Augustine lawn began to brown in some areas. Is this brown patch? If so, how do I treat it? Uh, let's see, brown patch. 
So brown, brown patch is caused by um, this fungal pathogen um, and it occurs typically in cooler temperatures. So when those temperatures start getting to be about 60 degrees at night, um, maybe 80s during the day, that cool and those moist conditions, obviously when that happens, it's the rainy season, typically hurricane season. Um, so it can really trigger um, the growth of that fungus. Uh, symptoms. Um, they're going to show in the fall or winter. Uh, we're probably grow a little bit bigger going into winter. Uh, they are, um, it's brown, tan, circular, or irregular shape. Um, now, if you bend down and you look at those leaf blades, those that leaf blade will detach from will detach from that runner when it's pulled. Um, this picture going back here, you can see how it. You know, it probably started as smaller irregular spots. It just started to um, more spots grew and then they combined and you know it, it's growing into a larger um, area. So prevention, number one, turn off the irrigation um, if you don't need it, especially going into the fall, definitely in, in, in the winter. Um, Water in the morning, I know we tend to reckon, um, recommend this, but ultimately we're like, you know what, whenever it gets watered, it gets watered. Um, but when you're going into the season of brown patch, um, you know, that is that is the motivation to water in the mor morning so it's not, uh, so it's able to uh, dry out a little bit during the day um, because it just spreads quicker in moist soil. Uh, don't mow wet grass. Um, and avoid spreading to other areas. So um, when you know if you actually um, identify that you have brown patch, uh, you one of the um, tricks may be to uh, remove those uh, clippings. And don't fertilize just because you see a brown patch does not mean that uh, that something needs to be fertilized. Uh, Fertilize at the proper time of year because when you apply um, at um, the wrong time of year, or in this case with brown patch, it just feeds uh, feeds that fungus. That nitrogen promotes growth, and it just gives the fungus uh, all the more to attack. Um, and then the other thing is um, not to fertilize when stressed. And again, that's usually we, we usually hear that as a go to, um, whether it's trees, shrubs, uh, lawn. Um, none of those things um, should be fertilized when um, when they're stressed. Wait until you know it's recovered and then you add that fertilizer. Uh, a treatment, the only treat the bit. The most effective is prevention, um, but if you do have to treat, um, you can use a fungicide. It will not kill, it will not eradicate this fungus at all. Um, now with regular applications, uh, you can help slow that growth. Um, and you want to do those applications when night temperatures are somewhere around 70 degrees. Um, if it goes below 70 degrees more than five days, then you can go ahead and stop. Um, and then um, once you come back in, so we're in, what month is it now? It's March. Oh my gosh, <laughs> it is March. So. Once it starts warming up, um, which it soon will, um, above 90 degrees, uh, this fungus tends to um, tends to slow. All right. Before we go on, any 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 questions that haven't been answered, Stephen? Uh, no, um, uh, Brandy. Uh, we did have a question from Lisa who asked a question: Is brown patch season? The winter, but I believe you you did cover that. Could you please repeat the uh, seasonality for the for the most active season of uh, brown patch? Yeah, so that would be definitely going into the fall, and fall and winter is when it um, you know it, it's it's its favorite um, playground. Uh, it uh, it enjoys being um, you know when oh my gosh I just got tongue tied there for a minute. Um, 
it's going to be uh, more moist. So, you know, when the rainy season starts to come and it's uh, that cool, the cool temperatures um, ushering in a little bit of the fall, that's what triggers the growth of the fungus. So it's once it starts cooling off and it gets wetter. Um, so what is this weed and how can I control it? Okay, so there's, um, you know, who knows how many uh, versions of this question, whatever weed. Um, in this case, it is Virginia buttonweed. Um, it's a creeping perennial. Uh, it roots along the nodes, so you can't really quite see it in this picture, but you can see that pink stem um, coming up off to the left, uh, and it, it grows as a runner. So each of those nodes, everywhere that it sits down, it, it'll it root, um, which is part of the problem with its persistence. Um, and it has, when it's flowering, it's easiest to identify with those four white uh, petals. Um, look, it's, it's a, it's a difficult weed, but look at that. Look how can we just appreciate <laughs> the beauty of that flower? It is so adorable. OK, now how to kill it. <laughs> oh, gosh, poor little thing. Um, so Virginia buttonweed really uh, it prol proliferates in poor draining um, soil, compacted soil, and it's just really difficult to manage. Um, so just put that out there um, so that way you don't have any um, uh, any expectations. Uh, again, prevention is best, uh, avoiding over watering and that um, poor draining soil. So here, this is the second time that uh, over watering can cause problems on your lawn and most lawns are typically over watered. So for chemical control, this um, metsulfuron methyl is an active ingredient um, that can be used. Um, I do believe I can't I can't remember if Stephen has um, has a link for that, um, but in any use of chemicals, you want to be sure to read and follow all herbicide label directions. Um, we can't really tell you how to apply any of those chemicals. Uh, we can help you read the labels, but I do want to, um, you know, let you know that um, these these small nurseries that you go to, um, some of them are family owned. They have been doing this for decades and they are an excellent resource um, when it comes to um, not only their plants, but the chemicals that they have on hand. So uh, you have numerous resources around um, where you live that can help you uh, figure out um, what to use. Uh, and then going into this um, St. Augustine lawn maintenance calendar, I, I do know there is a um, there's a link for this. Uh, there is a Bermuda grass one also, um, but showing you the St. Augustine, uh, if you have this on hand, this can answer a lot of your questions before you even have them. Um, and number one is fertilization. That's always a question. When do I fertilize? And you can see March and April um, is when you first do the application, but typically you do want um, that grass. Remember how I said you don't want it to be stressed. You want it to be healthy. So ensure that that lawn um, has uh, been mowed a couple times. That means it's really active um, and then you can start fertilizing. Um, and then uh, you're, you're going to have this now. You can see mowing. Typically mowing, we, um, we mow too low um, with St. Augustine. Um, mow it two to four inches um, and uh, mowing low also encourages uh, problems with pests. So that is um, one of the reasons that uh, we encourage proper mowing height. Um, but, but yeah, I love this calendar. It can answer a lot of your questions. And then some turf resources. Um, you've been um, given some along the way. Uh, so maintaining your grass lawns. Um, Aggie turf is a really good resource. Uh, I have on here, it, the, so the website's aggieturf.tmu.edu, but um, 
there's a tab on there or one of the categories is turf weed ID. And I just did a snapshot of that right here and um, that'll help you identify. Um, you know, if you can't identify from there, we can we can help with that. But um, this this puts the power in your hands. <laughs> And then you can click on each one of those and it, it gives you a little bit of information. And then watermyyard.org. I always um, mention, you know, when talking about turf, uh, it is a program that connects you with local weather and helps provide tips for your lawn and your irrigation system. So you put in um, where you're located, some some information about your yard. And um, so if there's a, you know, if there's a storm coming, it may say, you know, it may give you some tips to turn off your irrigation um, or um, or help you um, guide, help guide you on how much water you should actually be putting directly on your lawn when you're taking into account precipitation. So hopefully, hopefully you try that out and it helps. Um, going into trees. So, um, okay, how how could I not? <laughs> how can I not put this picture? It's so cute. Um, so my live oak leaves are all yellow, but the one across the street is green. What's going on with my tree? So here's another version. It's always some kind of comparison. Um, when you have yellowing leaves yes it could mean chlorosis um, lack of iron um, in um, this particular situation because it's current uh, we'll talk about what i think it is uh, but we have to keep in mind that live oaks uh, they appear evergreen uh, but they do lose their leaves they just kind of do it throughout the year um, if there's some kind of extreme weather events then uh, like the freeze that we just had, uh, you know, it can make them yellow up um, more um, simultaneously, I guess. Um, it doesn't mean that there's any pathogen. Uh, it is normal. Uh, old leaves come in and, uh, or new leaves come in and they replace uh, those um, old leaves going out. So in this situation, because we have gotten this question every week for a few weeks now, um, you know, we're going to attribute it directly to freeze damage. So we had that December 22 freeze, Christmas, right around Christmas time. That was right on the heels of the drought, which, you know, put a lot of stress on our trees. And even coming up to that drought, a lot of our local trees were probably still, still dealing with effects from that um, winter storm Uri. I know it's it's far enough away from us to not give us any give it any thought anymore, um, but that's not so for um, for the trees. So some of those symptoms are um, yellowing. It could be a little yellowing. It could be the whole tree. Um, leaf drop which once they yellow they are going to drop their leaves and then those new leaves are going to come in and replace them you might have some twig branch dieback now if you have excessive twig die um, twig and branch dieback that may mean something um, different um, and then leafing out uh, can be delayed um, another kind of version of this question that we'll get is uh, there's dropping um, cluster. Uh, what am I trying to say? Clusters of leaves with acorns are dropping, and um, if it's if it's not again, if it's not excessive, it's if it's not really big pieces, um, that typically could be from squirrel activity. Um, so that's a little bit different from what we're talking here. But going back to the freeze damage. Uh, it all comes down to patience. Uh, we just need to wait it out. We need to give them time. I mean, who knows how long some of those trees have been alive. And so um, they just might need a little bit more time to get their act together. Uh, on your part, you can reduce the stress inflicted on those trees. Um, you know, 
don't add fertilizer, um, any kind of chemicals, all, all that will just add to the stress of the trees. Um, if we are to have um, any other, um, another drought this summer, uh, and you know that your trees are already stressed, then consider some supplemental watering. Trees typically do not need supplemental water during a typical um, summer, but you know, um, with what it was just hit with and the and the drought, if we get into a serious drought again, um, you know they may need it. And then midsummer, um, at the latest midsummer, the leaves should be out. Um, if you do don't see leaves out by then, um, you may want to call an arborist, and um, you know it it it's possible it could have um, died. But what we're seeing right now, they. Uh, you know, it's it's just uh, just give it some more time. All right, so this is kind of a fun one. Um, my crepe myrtle trees have yellowed and have begun to defoliate. I see black sooty mold and an increase in ladybug beetles in the area. What concerns me is the presence of these weird orange guys on the other undersides of leaves. I love this part. Um, they are the same size as a lady beetle, only more stationary and with a more terrifying mouth. Oh my gosh, I love that description. <laughs> oh, if you're not laughing at home, feel free to. It's got a terrifying mouth. Um, I love it. So um, sometimes questions are really straightforward, linear. Um, this there's so many different things going on here. The yellowed leaves dropping, sooty mold, beetles, weird orange guys. Um, and some of you may know what I'm gonna um, say about this. So all everything that was in that um, question or description um, screams crepe myrtle bark scale. So that is a uh, that bark scale is an infestation of scale. It's an invasive insect from Asia. It's not deadly. It will not kill your tree. It just really doesn't make it nice looking. <laughs> um, but that scale, um, all that scale, you can see in the pictures in the in this picture here how um, you know they're all over. Well, they secrete a honeydew and that honeydew um, can uh, create a fungus. And so when you have sooty mold, it is a direct uh, byproduct of, um, it could be aphids on another, um, you know, on another plant. And in this case, it's the crepe myrtle, crepe myrtle um, bark scale. So you can see the adults, they're a little bit gray white. Um, and the only thing on the symptoms here that I don't have is, is if you go to crush them, uh, it oozes like that pink uh, fluid. But uh, symptoms, sooty mold, uh, reduced bloom, delayed leaf flush, and um, ants. Uh, the ant presence is really cool. This happens on many other um, plants, especially with aphids, where uh, fire and sugar ants, they basically, uh, they, they protect that scale because they're creating the honeydew that then um, they utilize. So they're almost, um, you know, kind of, kind of farming <laughs> those, uh, that scale, except the scale doesn't really move much. So prevention, uh, I mean, crepe myrtles bloom so reliably and prolifically that it's hard not to use them. They do they do well here, right? Um, but uh, overuse definitely increase, increases the spread. So um, diversifying landscapes means, you know, let's let's try to plant some other things. Um, you know, when winter comes, it doesn't it doesn't kill them. Um, you know, it's it's probably being spread um, from uh, wind and humans. Um, so let's just try to mix some things up. 
uh, maintain healthy trees. Uh, so if your tree is young, um, if it's stressed, if um, if it's experienced extreme cold, extreme heat, uh, deep shade, all of that can um, uh, create create a situation, um, create an ideal, I should say, um, situation for um, the scale to come in. Management that 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 um, we're going to bring in that orange uh, creepy guy. So. That orange creepy guy, that's actually a good sign um, because that means that there he first he said there were lady beetles in the in the area, but then he had um, the guy with the terrifying mouth and this is just a pupa stage. This is um, his photo from uh, Ask Extension. Um, this is just the pupa stage of the lady beetle and then once it turns into adult, then the adults will you know, they come out, they emerge and continue feeding on that scale, continue laying eggs, and then, you know, the cycle continues with those beneficial insects. Um, if you use insecticides um, for this particular um, problem, then just be sure that it is safe for those beneficial insects. Um, there was one small study done, I'm trying to, I, I cannot remember where I read it, um, but in that study, uh, lady beetles uh, suppress scale up to 75%. So, I mean, it can, it, they can really make a big impact. Um, that top picture is a twice stab lady beetle if you've never seen one. So, you know, it's just not the um, Asian beetles or, um, or the other typical lady beetles or ladybugs that you're, that you're used to seeing. And um, you, you're going to have this link. This is this is like everything we just talked about. Uh, <laughs> it's it's really great to have. You can see why there's a pink fluid that comes out of those that scale when when it's crushed. Um, and I think that's a really great uh, a great visual with the um, reduced blooms uh, on the left, not infected. On the right, it is. And then uh, I didn't really talk about topping. Uh, I mean, most professionals really will not recommend topping. Um, we understand why it's done. It, it It's definitely something that, you know, landscape companies are able to go out and provide that service. Um, unfortunately, it is thought to create really great conditions for crepe myrtle bark scale. Um, it just gives some more, um, uh, the tree's going to be stressed. Uh, all those wounds have to heal, and it it just creates um, a, a nice little habitat. All right, um, this is probably one of the top two questions, maybe top two or three questions. How do I find a reputable arborist? And it's a very simple answer. Uh, we recommend treesaregood.org. Uh, this is a website. It offers some tips, educational activities, which um, are actually pretty interesting if you want to look through. Uh, I mean, they're separated by classroom, community, and then um, online. Uh, but if you, um, one of the sections on there is find an arborist. You put in your zip code and uh, all the arborists that are certified with the International Society of, of Arboriculture will be listed. So when you call extension and you ask, how do I find a reputable arborist? This is our answer. Um, when do you need to see an arborist? Uh, you know, when, well, if, if we let you know <laughs> based on your your um, questions, um, but you know, when it when it's just too big of a job, you know, we may be able to kind of confirm what you have through pictures the best we can, uh, but uh, that's why a lot of times we'll say, you know, you definitely want to talk to um, talk to someone about that. If you have any major uh, pruning, um, this is this is where to go. And tree uh, resources. Um, this one wasn't on here, but if you uh, go to stopcmbs.com, um, that actually gives you some chemical controls. Uh, they're they're not 
that effective. Um, you have to be really regular with them. So if you have crepe mar myrtle bark scale or if you have um, sooty mold, you can kind of power wash some of it off. Um, it's only going to really um, do the adults and or you can scrub it, you know, for just just for it to look a little bit better visually. Um, but this website does have some chemical controls, um, but um, you have to be really regular with it. Uh, there's the um, the bark scale forest service and then this other one oak leaf diseases. Um, that's through Texas oak .org. We can get oak wilt here. It's just very, very not common. I've, I've never um, seen a case of it in around Houston. Um, but what I really liked about this particular website is that you see um, you can click on uh, this is not oak wilt and it and it just creates it has a, a big list of different diseases or pests for live oaks and um, it's a really great visual for you to kind of help you assess what's going on with your um, your tree. Stephen. Yes, everything going all right? Uh, yes, we did. We, yes, we did have a comment from one of our um, attendees mm -hmm. uh, asking about um, the uh, toxic or uh, detrimental effects using metsulfuron methyl um, regarding exposure to ornamental plants. And I was able to uh, go online really quickly and mm -hmm. uh, provide, get a little bit of an answer for that. Metsulfuron methyl applied appropriately, especially at lower rates, can be effective on controlling weeds in the lawn. Unfortunately, uh, with a prolonged exposure, it can affect um, more uh, species that are a little bit more sensitive to that, like uh, live oak or other ornamental trees. So any chemical or pesticide apl applied appropriately can uh, be effective in weed control, but of course, uh, caution should be observed and uh, always reading labels before application is, is definitely a, a plus in, in any of our ventures into lawn management. Yeah, thank you for that. And, you know, it, it's always a fine line of, you know, what what to what to bring up, um, what to, you know, not bring up. And the fact of the matter is, is we do get these questions. Um, but in the long run, uh, any of the chemicals, especially if they're not applied properly, um, can really have an impact um, on the plants around and pollinators. And, um, you know, it, it can have a long line of um, of repercussions, uh, but like you said, and I think one of the biggest thing, if you are going to use any um, herbicide, insecticide, do it on a non-windy day and read the label and apply it directly to what, um, you know, tr try your best to apply it directly to what you are um, trying to address. Uh, broad spectrum insecticides, uh, you, I don't know, I guess in some situations, uh, you might need them, uh, but try to identify exactly what it is you're you're trying to uh, manage and get the most specific uh, product for that. So you're not necessarily, um, uh, you know, trying to, um, you know, affect uh, a broad range of, um, of, of insects. I don't know, did that make sense? Hopefully. <laughs> Oh gosh. Okay, so tomatoes. You know what? I'm going to take a drink real quick. Going to the last um, last topic, tomatoes. What is causing the bottom of my tomatoes to turn brown? So um, usually this is an easy one, blossom and rot. Um, it's not a disease. It's a um, physiological problem. Uh, it can, um, it's really, uh, as the states, caused by calcium deficiency due to moisture fluctu fluctuations. It could be a calcium um, deficiency in the soil. Uh, more often than not though, probably it's that the plant just cannot take it up and it starts having trouble taking um, that calcium up when they're, um, when there are issues with with water. 
a lot of times this is under our control. Um, we know that we need to go out and water. We just haven't. Um, things are drying out, um, but sometimes uh, it's beyond our control. Uh, you know, summers are really hot and well, summer, I should say late spring <laughs> and then even fall. You know, we can have some really sunny, dry days and then we can get a lot of rain. So maybe there's a situation. I know last year was generally not a good year for tomatoes um, for a number of reasons. Um, but generally your um, cultural practices can really help prevent um, blossom end rot. So it's that deterioration of that blossom end of, uh, of, the, of the fruit. And then it goes through a series of different appearances. You know, it might look water soaked, um, like a wet bruise at first. Uh, and then you see um, on the center, uh, tomato, how it starts looking sunken, like black leathery. Um, it usually, so okay, so blossom end rot first usually starts the 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 beginnings of it start when there's a lot of growth during a you know during a period. Um, so. Hold on, I have to re I have to reword. I have to rethink this. Um, it starts when there's a lot of growth happening, like towards the um, you know towards the end of spring, um, just before we have like those really hot long days. So what that tells me is that um, it's generally cultural practices, and that we do have um, we have control to prevent this. Uh, and then by the time it actually appears is when that fruit is like about a third to um, halfway developed. Um, so it starts long before we even that fruit appears and that, um, you know, that fruit gets large enough. So it's really important, you know, as that tomato is growing um, to um, take care of that. Be sure that, you know, it's not going through a lot of dry periods. It's not going through a lot of um, wet periods. You're just kind of keeping it consistently moist. Um, interestingly, um, this is something I just, uh, I guess I, I was made aware of, that it's really not typical for cherry tomatoes, um, blossom and rot. Uh, but it can also happen on other vegetables like um, peppers, peppers and squash. So prevention, we kind of talked about that. Um, uh, maintain even uh, soil moisture and then mulching. Mulching really helps because uh, when when we do get those high temperatures, that mulch can help um, keep that soil uh, moister and cooler. Um, there really is no treatment once it's present. Um, basically, you're just going to have to get rid of that fruit. Um, don't let it drop and fall. Uh, it's possible you can do a lime application before planting season if you think that it's calcium. Um, calcium deficiency in your soil, uh, which you would need a soil test to, to figure out anyway. Um, but avoiding high nitrogen applications. So um, using a balanced fertilizer, um, a lot of that nitrogen can create more, um, more foliage, create um, uh, more stress, a little bit more stress on that plant and um, uh, drying out the soil a little bit, a um, little bit quicker. One of the resources that you can use um, when you're trying to figure out what's going on with your tomatoes is on the Aggie Hort um, or Aggie Horticulture uh, website. There's a tomato problem solver. There is a cucurbit problem solver too. Um, but as you can see with this one, uh, you know you can look at um, if you, if your problem is on ripe fruit, um, if it's insects, if it's stems. Um, in this particular situation, I pulled up uh, disorders for ripe tomato fruits and you see blossom uh, end rot right there. So you can click on each one of these and, and try to, um, you know, identify what's going on with uh, your tomato or tomato plants uh, based um, visually on your observations. 
Uh, what are the best tomatoes for containers? Not these tomatoes. <laughs> these are a couple master gardeners. Um, this this picture is a little old, but I, I couldn't resist. So um, they don't need to grow in um, containers. We'll we'll look at a few that will. Um, <laughs> So first of all, container tomatoes, uh, you want to focus on determinate varieties. Um, they're basically called bush. They can grow up to four feet tall, and essentially that fruit ripens in a short, short amount of time. Indeterminate, um, they can grow a lot taller, uh, eight feet tall. Um, while the determinate, you don't necessarily have to provide support. Um, it does help, especially because um, some of them have such a heavy fruit load, having that support would help. But with the indeterminate getting up to eight feet tall, you definitely need um, staking and, and support. Uh, with indeterminate, uh, they continue to bloom as long as temperatures are good. Um, so determinate, it, it ripens, and I shouldn't say short, short. It's not like they all ripen at the same time. Um, but with indeterminate, uh, they can keep on blooming as long as those temperatures are right. And when the temperature is not right is when um, nights start um, regularly being 80 degrees or over. That uh, flower production uh, either slows or, or stops. Um, and I think Stephen has or um, Shannon has a uh, link for um, I did a the homegrown. It was this year earlier this year. It was uh, tomatoes for the patio. And so these are a few of the varieties from that video. Um, you can definitely grow indeterminate tomatoes in pots. Um, you know, our goal is to provide you some options that are just uh, a, provide um, provide a little bit more ease in your tomato growing. You know, why why make something more more high maintenance, um, a little bit more difficult? Um, so I have here patio choice in the upper left. Um, those are cherry tomatoes. They grow 15 to 18 inches tall, tall and wide. So, um, you know, they can they can really get a good fruit load. Um, those fruits are um, around a half an ounce, so they're pretty small in this group. These are the smallest. Um, they come in red and yellow. And with determinate tomatoes, uh, you want a harvest that harvest date, um, you know, 70, I'd say 70 days or below um, because, you know, you want to be able to, um, you know, have a really good harvest before the heat of summer. Your, um, I'll go down to the sweet and neat on the bottom uh, right. Those, that's another dwarf cherry. Well, this one's dwarf because it only gets eight to 10 inches tall. So you don't have to have some crazy big tomato to have tomatoes. Um, these are less than an ounce small, um, less than an ounce, um, the fruit. So they're a little bit bigger than patio choice. Um, these are 60 days to, um, to maturity. Um, going above that, bush early girl, um, that's really like a standard bush slicer, um, something you can put on some sandwiches. Um, grows 18 to 24 inches tall, so it still doesn't grow um, that big, but you get like six to seven ounce um, um, fruits from it. And uh, it's it can it can really put on a lot of fruit. Uh, that's 65 days to harvest. And then celebrity is going to be our tallest. We call this a semi-determinant. Uh, so that fruit is going to, um, it's going to fruit over a little bit longer of a period. Um, you're going to want a bigger pot. You can't get away with the pot, you know, that you use for sweet and neat. It grows um, three to four feet tall. Uh, maybe provide a little bit more support for this. This has 70 days. Um, and this one particularly, um, all of these tomatoes have some kind of uh, disease resistance. Um, this uh, celebrity, not only is it um, uh, an all-American selection, but it's also a Texas superstar. So, you know, it's been proven to do really well. So there's some ideas for um, tomatoes in a container. And we're going to finish this up.
with the last question. Um, I have three eight inch holes in my tomatoes with one inch dark caterpillars on the plants. I sprayed BT on the plants as well as the fruit two days before seeing the eaten fruit. What should I be doing? So with this person, we already ruled out that it wasn't um, birds. He did, um, he did see caterpillars. And uh, otherwise, it, it is it, going back. It's difficult to treat without identifying that that pest. Um, but he treated with Bacillus thuringiensis. I always get that name wrong, um, <laughs> which is a pesticide um, that can um, really be in a form of a spray, granular, granular um, stuff like that. So BT is uh, really a bacterium whose spores. Those spores are toxic to the insects um, that eat them. Um, but the trick is it's insect larva. So that's a lot of times when we say, you know, you, you want to monitor your garden um, and catch things uh, before they become a problem. Catch insects when they're young um, because you can do a lot of um, manual control that way. Uh, but also if you do go uh, a chemical route, then um, whether it's organic or synthetic, uh, a lot of times it's more effective on um, on the larva. And just to give a real quick um, mention about integrated pest management, um, this is really um, a way to eliminate pests, um, doing it the most environmentally friendly way. And it's not just um, thinking of the environment, it's cost savings. It's um, what's um, what's best to, um, you know, the plants surrounding it, the other insects. Um, so always try to um, use a non-chemical means first. So your cultural practices going out and, and monitoring, like I said, if you have some aphids, um, a small, uh, small population, you can easily spray those off. Um, Leaf-footed bugs, you, um, boy, if this, if I was doing this, you know, in, in a few months, we'd probably have more questions about that. Leaf-footed bugs are harder to manage as adults. Um, they congregate as um, these orange little um, guys uh, when they're younger. And so you can knock them all into a, a soapy bucket, um, you know, apply a spray. Uh, but once they become adults, I mean, you're not going to find something that you're going to be able to spray on them that's going to be effective. Um, with the adults, you know, you, you might just be able to um, pick them off and knock them into a bucket. But always start, you know, by monitoring um, and um, trying to pre you know prevention practices first uh, then physical um, you might go biological and then chemical is your last resort um, so before heading out uh, we talked about, uh, especially with your turf and your beds, um, before applying fertilizer. Um, how do you know what to uh, what what to apply if you haven't tested your soil? Um, it is recommended every three years. Um, and A and M, um, Texas A and M AgriLife Extension, um, offers this professional diagnostic soil testing to check for those nutrient deficiencies, whether it's your vegetables, lawn, fruits, trees. Um, flowers. Uh, it's pretty inexpensive. So when you go to that website, uh, you want to choose the urban soil submittal form. And most homeowners just need the number one routine analysis unless something else has been mentioned to them. And that number one analysis is $12. Um, you will uh, on the website uh, submit payment or arrange payment. Uh, you will um, mail your samples and then you'll get the um, results back in an email. Um, you are provided some directions on how to do a soil sample. You know, um, you know, if you're doing like a flower bed, you want to uh, remove all the organic material on top first, um, dig down about six inches, um, and then put that um, in a Ziploc bag. And within one test site, you can do that like six to eight times or eight to ten times. And that's going to um, be your one soil sample.
uh, the plant diagnostic lab. Um, this is for plant material. If you really think that there is a disease that you're dealing with, um, we can help in some instances with photographs to identify that, um, but uh, you can also send it, uh, and I don't know the cost for this one, um, but send living materials. Um, I'm trying to see if I put something about how to do that. So plant material, living material with problems. So twigs, stems, roots. Sometimes with turf, you see this, um, this delineation. If you have an unknown problem, then what you can do is you can send them a sam sample, but you don't want to just send dead material. Um, they will joke that they are not morticians. <laughs> they need something alive to figure out what's going on. So you would take a little bit of the um, live side, a little bit of the dead side, and um, you know some in between. Uh, they do not test for pesticide residuals. They do not test for nutrients or to toxic materials. They do not do plant or in insect ID. Um, they are um, there to um, just test for potential um, disease problems. Oh, I feel like I'm losing my voice. Does it sound like it? Oh goodness. Um, <laughs> all right. Well, look, we made it. We made it back. We made it all. We made it through. Um, it's been almost an hour. Uh, Stephen, Shannon, are there any pressing questions or interesting questions that you want to, um, you know, put on the recording? Well, um, thank you very much, Brandy. That was an excellent presentation. Um, the questions uh, have been very few and I've uh, been able to manage some of them. One of them was um, an offer of suggestions should, should calcium nitrate be used to prevent blossom and rot? And my answer to that is yes. Uh, that ammonium-based um, ammonium -based sources of nitrogen uh, can bind up or um, can reduce calcium uptake in the plant. Uh, so uh, it is better to use a nitrate based uh, fertilizer. Yeah, and we 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 even talked about that um, the other day. So yeah, yeah. They, I, that was good that they mentioned that because I just glossed over it. Good. Anything else? No, I think you've you've addressed every everything uh, on here and um, you know, very few questions, but a very, very good presentation. Yeah, yeah. Well, hopefully, um, you know, this can be used to answer some questions in in the future. Definitely, we provided some great resources. Um, utilize those. Uh, you know, even if you don't have any um, current problems, they're 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 really interesting to go. You know, that eggy turf. Um, um, the uh, even the the problem solvers, um, some of them are just really kind of interesting to to look at. So, hey, look, I want to thank you all for being here. Um, thanks, Stephen Bruggerhoff, for answering the questions. Um, Shannon Sullivan, um, she, sh Shannon, uh, I'll just give you a, I'll give you all a heads up. Shannon Sullivan will probably be doing her own presentation here pretty soon. And um, yeah, just thank you for joining us. Uh, and um, until next time, be a look, be on the lookout with that newsletter to find out what, um, what our 2023 plan is going forward. All right, thank you so much.